a gloomy Friday afternoon in Texas. That's Low Stratus, north of a frontal boundary, located near the Gulf Coast region. And we can head right to the maps to see what's happening. That's that frontal system, the same one that we had yesterday. That's pretty much stationary from south of Atlanta to Shreveport and down towards San Antonio. North of that, we've got a bit of overrunning in place. Upper level flow riding over that cold air mass. And since it's fairly humid tropical air, it readily saturates. And as a result, we get low clouds and even a bit of fog and drizzle across Arkansas, northern Mississippi, and northeast Texas. Here's the satellite imagery showing the tropical air flowing northward across Louisiana and southeast Texas. The low-level moisture formed up into cumulus streets, and that's given us that configuration of clouds that we see right there. Along the frontal boundary, a few showers going up. And then north of the frontal boundary, we get into a more mild, dry air mass. And a lot of that is composed of stratus and stratocumulus, fairly stable compared to what we have further to the south. And then you get a little bit further north, and all that you have is high cirrus clouds rapidly moving over the Dallas-Fort Worth and Abilene area. Of course, Texas is not the only area of interest. The southwestern U.S. showing clear skies, but up to the north looks like an approaching storm system up there in northern Nevada. Up to the north, we can see some evidence of fast flow aloft with that cirrus rapidly moving to the south and in the lower levels, stratocumulus right off the coast off of Eureka, Fort Bragg, Arcata, moving straight down the coast. So very likely we've got a frontal system across northern California and Nevada. There's the water vapor imagery for this evening showing jet stream energy coming down through western Oregon and also the characteristic S-shape of a Bear Clinic system in the Salt Lake City area. And so because of that S-shape and also the clearing, the indication of some drier air to the northwest, that's going to indicate a shortwave across northern Nevada, a shortwave trough. You can see that lift out ahead of it right there. And also some evidence of the jet itself right back here. You can see that on the south side of the jet, on the equatorward side, upward motion. That's the ascending branch of the transfer circulation there. And then we have the subsidence on the other side. And that pretty much puts the jet max in this area right there, where we see the strongest contrast between indications of lift and indications of subsidence. Not quite so strong up to the north, but definitely in that area right there. That's going to be where the jet max is going to be located. And there's how things look on the heights and vorticity chart. That's going to be right around the current time. And we can see the jet running right through this area here. The short wave is kind of channeled. That's going to be it right there. And the jet max located right there in that region, maybe a little bit further back across northwestern Nevada. Out in the plains, we see another shortwave trough right there in western Nebraska, western Kansas, putting the lift out in this region. But we know that the air mass in that area is kind of dry, so that's likely not producing any thunderstorms or showers or anything like that. You can see overall that we've got a definite tendency towards long wave troughing. The height lines as a whole kind of show a U-shape appearance. And that's due to the tendency for cool air and radiational cooling over the central U.S. right there. And as a result, that causes heights to fall. But of course, embedded within that long wave trough are these medium to short wave troughs right there, and of course, medium to shortwave ridges in between those. There's a big one right there. And what kind of weather do we see out there? 
Well, definitely some windy weather in the northern Nevada deserts. Gusts up to 35 there at Winnemucca. And those familiar north winds at Tonopah, which indicate the presence of a cold air mass. So the front is going to be located somewhere in this area here. I'm curving that north through California due to the warm temperatures in the northern Sacramento Valley. And then the other end is going to be out there in western Colorado, somewhat like that. And I think that puts the warm nose just south of Salt Lake City. I think Salt Lake City may have just had frontal passage. And we can also see snow showers up to the north. That's indicating some lift there associated with that short wave. And there might be a bit of an occlusion of that frontal system in the mid-levels. So we've already talked about what's happening in Texas, but let's set our sights out to the east. Well, we can really pick out that front there, not so much in Texas, but definitely through Louisiana. Look at that, 78 at Monroe versus 57 at El Dorado. And we continue that front out to the west, pretty much just south of Birmingham, south of Atlanta, in through the Macon area, and down, down towards Charleston. So might be a might be a little bit more wavy than that, somewhat like that. And of course, we've got a couple of cyclones embedded in that frontal axis. One cyclone probably about right there and maybe another one right in this area where you see the cyclonic convergence of the wind field. So that's the way it looks there in Jackson, Mississippi, checking in with 80 degrees. 81 there at Macomb, and also very warm conditions in Florida. Well, not much to see on the water vapor imagery. Looks like a pocket of dry air in the mid and upper levels moving across the southeast U.S. And this is also telling us that we're not seeing very much in the way of upper level dynamics. So most of the weather is moderated by the surface-based systems. But you get out a little to the west there, yeah, there is some moisture coming in from Mexico and Texas. And we can use the visible imagery to find the frontal boundary locations. And based on this, looks to be in that area right there. You can see that wave structure going on. I'm not sure exactly where that is, but it's going to be somewhere in Alabama or Georgia. In the northeast, we start out with visible imagery, and then it switches over to IR since it's getting to be nighttime there. Now, this definitely indicates an upper-level system moving across that area. And I can see kind of an S shape in there. So I might be looking for a shortwave in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. And there it is. You can see the lift out ahead of that. Looks like it's broken up into these little clusters, probably due to some high static instability through that area. And the water vapor imagery showing a compact system moving to the east, and it's probably outrun the model guidance a little bit. Based on this, I would think that the shortwave axis would be in Pennsylvania and Virginia, something like that, right through that region right there. The surface chart indicating that the system is pretty well detached from the baroclinicity down to the south. You can see that there's not much indication of anything at the surface in the northeastern U.S., just kind of a easterly flow covering much of the region and temperatures in the 30s and 40s. And as you get south into the Virginia area, Kentucky, that's where you start picking up the rain and the higher precipitable waters. And then panning things up to the northern plains. Yep, there is a fresh outbreak of cold air up there in Canada. Looks like the leading edge is now just just starting to enter northeastern Montana there. Some very cold temperatures north of that and the warm front looks like that's going to be in northern Minnesota, kind of like that. The surface cyclone in far southwestern Manitoba. And south of that, just a lot of downslope and dry conditions due to the descending 
adiabatically warming air coming from the high plains. The water vapor imagery showing that there's not a whole lot of upper level support bound up with that surface system, which is up there in Manitoba. And things are mostly dominated by this outgoing shortwave trough and the next one coming up from the southwest. So that's how the patterns look in the northern plains. Little instability in the Dakotas. Dew points are on the low side, so that's going to be some mid-level moisture and mid-level instability. And it looks like we're even getting a few weak anvils out of that stuff there around Rapid City to Pierre. So let's go back over the surface chart, look at that upper air support. And yeah, there's this shortwave trough scraping by to the south, giving them just a little bit of lift and a little bit of shear. And that's enough to support some of those cells down there. And we can see the dew points down in the single digits to 15 there. So we're not going to be getting much of any precip out of that stuff. Relative humidity is probably down below 30%. So it looks like a lot of virga and windy conditions in that part of the country. So what kind of weather are we going to be looking at this weekend? Well, it is a slow weather day, but let's take a look and see what's in store. We do have a very progressive, fast-moving pattern, and you can see out there in Colorado, Kansas, the next frontal system tomorrow night already spilling out into the central plains. By Sunday, we've got this little compact system moving into Iowa and Wisconsin Sunday morning. So we're going to get some snow there in the Minneapolis area and further south where we have the moisture advection, the warm air advection, some showers and thunderstorms in the Ohio River region. Going into early next week, yep, we're bringing down some colder air into the northern plains, and here's an Alberta clipper coming together in Minnesota. That's going to move into the Chicago and Indianapolis area. Most of the cold air advection will be focused on that region Monday, and that's not going to go very far south at all. 1038 millibar high, 1037. That's going to be moving southeast, and that will push most of the cold air into the eastern U.S. Down in Texas, looks like some isentropic lift, little stagnant frontal boundary. That'll keep conditions kind of cloudy. Then going into midweek, looks pretty quiet. Nothing big happening. Looks like the lee side trough getting reestablished in Colorado for Wednesday and Thursday. Here's a little Pacific system coming through Arizona. That's going to be our watching. Let's see if anything happens. Yep, there it comes together in the West Texas region. And then for Thursday into Friday, yep, that really comes together. So we're going to keep our eye on that for late in the week. And that'll move eastward into the eastern U.S. next weekend. Yep, some rain, showers, maybe even a little bit of severe weather with that. But as you can see, not much cold air. So the northern fringes still remaining as cold rain. And that's probably about as far as we want to go. Yeah, it looks like things get a little bit active in the western U.S. for... The second week in March, but that's pretty far out. A Europe this evening appears to be under high pressure, 1042 millibar high over the UK. And that's given kind of a mild northwesterly flow to much of Germany and Poland. And the frontal boundaries, those are going to be probably set up down there in the Balkans, Italy. Things look kind of mild down there in the Mediterranean, and overall, not really seeing much of any weather going on. How about Asia? Anything interesting going on there? Well, they've got this strong frontal system that has pushed through Japan, some strong cold air advection blowing through the islands right there, and then out towards Korea and, and further west towards China, looks like a new system coming in from the northwest right there. 
I can also see an old frontal boundary down there in southern China. So what's going to happen here? If we run that forward, looks like a little wave gets going around Okinawa. You can see that picking up some steam there. So the frontal boundaries looking kind of like that right there. And let's see what happens Saturday into Sunday. Well, it looks like that remains kind of a stable wave right there, but this looks to be coming together out there in China. That's a new frontal system right there in the Shanghai area, and that may have some upper level support. So by late Sunday into Monday, looks like a potent weather system there coming through Korea, and the easterly winds off the East Sea bringing in some snow into the northeast coastal regions. And that looks like quite a snowstorm there for overnight Monday into Tuesday. When I forecast it in Korea, I don't think I've ever seen an east coast system this strong. Then going into Tuesday, looks like it moves rapidly eastward, and the brunt of that snow on the backside affects the northwestern coastal regions of Japan. So I hope you enjoyed that little bonus tour of what's happening around the world. I know a lot of weather media here in the U.S. tends to focus only on the U.S. I mean, we don't even hardly cover Canada, and I think that's kind of a shame because there's a lot to learn about from other parts of the world. So we're coming up on another weekend, and that means on Monday, we will be back with the supporter-only video. So if you want to get signed up for that, here's the link. And you can rest easy knowing that you're a supporter of this program, and you're keeping it going for quite a while to come. Occasionally on the Monday video, we will show the studio, which we never do on the public videos. So you may want to check that out and get a better perspective. And during severe weather season, the supporter videos will include a detailed severe weather analysis workup. So that's yet another reason to become a supporter. And for everybody else, we will see you back here on Tuesday. Hope you all have a great weekend. Take care and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.